In this video, we're going to discuss spontaneous versus non-spontaneous reactions. Some reactions just seem to carry themselves. Let's think of our first example here. I have wood. Well, C6H12O6, really sugar, but wood is mostly cellulose. Cellulose is sugar. This sugar can react with dioxygen, makes CO2, makes water. If you ever light a piece of wood on fire, you need a little bit of heat to get it going, and then it carries itself. It continues to burn and burn and give off heat. It's an exothermic reaction. It has a negative delta H for this reaction. The reverse reaction, however, taking carbon dioxide and water, turning it into sugar and oxygen, well, this doesn't happen on its own. Without light for photosynthesis to occur, plants don't photosynthesize. They need that sunlight to drive the reaction. Unless you have the very specialized machinery of the plant cell set up to harness the light to do it, you're not going to have carbon dioxide and water turn into sugar. This requires an input of energy, so it's a positive delta H. One of these happens on its own. You might need a little spark to get over the activation energy to start it, but once it's going, it provides its own energy and drives itself. The other most definitely does not. So what's different here? Is it just delta H, the change in enthalpy? If we think about a bunch of molecules turning into a bunch of other molecules as they reorganize and giving away energy, well, it's hard to go backwards unless that energy returns. So it kind of makes sense that an exothermic reaction is easier than an endothermic because without that energy coming in, you can't do the endothermic. This, however, ends up not being what's the deciding factor. It was originally thought it might be, but we can think of a few reactions where it's endothermic, but still spontaneous, where it just happens on its own. Sodium chloride solid will dissolve in water. It makes a sodium cation aqueous and a chloride anion aqueous. Well, this has a delta H of reaction. That's equal to plus three kilojoules. It's endothermic. When you actually put sodium chloride into water, it cools the water as it dissolves. Despite that we throw it down to keep melt ice and keep it off paths and everything, the reality is that it actually cools the liquid when it dissolves and separates. This is convenient if you've ever made home ice cream, if you had an ice cream churn, you have a little bucket with all the stuff inside, and around that bucket, you put a bunch of ice cubes and a ton of salt. As the salt interacts with the ice, it will cause it to liquefy as it depresses the melting point, but it also cools it as it dissolves, surrounding the ice cream churn by lower than freezing temperature water. Well, if you've ever put salt into water, like it'll dissolve. Stir it a little dissolves quite nicely. It definitely will spontaneously dissolve. It can take a little while if you don't mix it, but it will eventually dissolve. So this is spontaneous despite being endothermic. So it isn't just positive or negative enthalpy. In fact, what's spontaneous or non-spontaneous can be subject to the conditions that you are in. If we think about a chemical change process like solid water turning into liquid water, well, this requires energy. The delta H of fusion for water is plus 333 joules per gram. You have to put energy in to turn ice into liquid water. And yet, if you leave an ice cube out on your counter, it's going to melt. At least if it's above the freezing temperature. Lower the temperature, however, and you will favor freezing. Going backwards is negative 333 joules per gram. Your water molecules, as they're floating around being water, rolling, flowing over each other, still in contact, for them to lock into place and kind of solidify and then have other ones do the same thing in order to form a solid, they have to give away energy as they do it to lock into place. They have to abandon some of their kinetic energy to isolate into place. Now, the idea, hey, energy was given away, so if it doesn't come back, well, then it would be hard to break out of the solid to go back into the liquid. 
But we know at warmer temperatures, we do favor going to the liquid. Remember, there's all the other material in the universe, all the container around it, the other water molecules, and they have energy. They will bump into our solid and transfer some energy, and it might be enough to break it free and get it rolling again. At a given temp, there's an exchange of energy constantly as particles bounce into each other. At colder temps, the rate that the energy is being transferred into the molecules is lower than is necessary for how fast it can get rid of the energy as it locks into place. As a result, over time, while it will gain some energy from the outside, it will also lose some energy. And the net effect is that it will continue to cool down and lose energy until particles have locked into place. Randomly, other things bouncing into it might make one break free, and there is a little bit of an equilibrium between liquid and solid, or even solid and gas, as a few particles will occasionally be given enough energy to break free from the material. At higher temps, there's enough outside energy that is being put into the molecules faster than they can be lost as they solidify, and they will continuously be broken apart. Anytime some stick together, before more can really accumulate, outside sources will drive energy back in, forcing them apart and keeping them liquid. Some processes change whether they're spontaneous based on the available thermal energy. Freezing, boiling, condensing, subliming, all these things are subject to the temperature. So which processes chemical changes will go through is often spontaneous only within certain temperature ranges. So we see from a variety of reactions here that when a chemical reaction or chemical change occurs, whether it's spontaneous or not, is subject to various things other than just the enthalpy, the heats of reaction. Well, what's one of the things causing it? Let's think for a moment about that salt. I've got some salt in the container. Well, salt is a series of ions, closely packed, nicely arranged, to opposite charges. They're locked heavily into place. They can vibrate and shake a little bit within their lattice, but they are more or less locked in position. The water molecules, on the other hand, are bouncing around, free floating, moving all over. They're liquid, and so they can shift and drift and rotate. Well, why does the salt dissolve? Oxygen's partially negative, hydrogen's are partially positive. And so when I get a water molecule, the oxygen can interact with the sodium. And a few other waters can do it as well. And occasionally, just a water will hit hard enough, slamming into things, transferring energy to bust one of those sodiums free. And the other waters will be around, they'll form bonds to it, and it will get solvated. That sodium will be able to drift away. Some of my molecules then are floating around in the beaker. Like, it's possible the sodium could just come back, bounce in, and get stuck. But all told, it has every direction possible to go. It's unlikely it's going to go straight back into its original spot. It's probably going to float away and drift. And then another ion is going to get hit and knocked free and surrounded by water. We'll get a chloride, and the hydrogens will face towards it. Partially positive hydrogens will interact, and so they'll drift away. And you'll get another ion, and another, and another. And over time, your solid will get smaller and smaller and smaller as it starts to run out. It's possible some of those ions will bounce back. They'll travel through solution and stick to it. But given all the space it has to go, it's actually far more likely it's just going to drift away. And as a result, over time, your solid starts to dissolve breaks apart and keeps floating off, it spreads out throughout the liquid. Getting all of those ions to come back together in one spot is really unlikely. They're going to keep bouncing around at random, being in random places, and given enough time, should be fairly homogeneously mixed throughout the whole container. Despite that it actually takes energy, that some water molecule has to slam into the salt pretty hard to break one of those ions free, once one of them is broken free, it's not terribly likely for it to return. As long as the rate of it leaving is faster than the rate of its return, your solid will continue to break apart into free ions and float away into solution. 
Now you can eventually reach a point where there is enough stuff dissolved that they do return at the same rate they're leaving. This is a saturated solution. And you get the maximum amount of salt. So if you pour enough salt into a container of water and shake, it'll get really salty, but they'll still be solid at the bottom. But it is possible to get to that point. But for a while, spreading out the material, dispersing it throughout the whole solution to lower the concentration from a very concentrated small area of solid to a much lower concentration, big volume of solution. There's a driving force for this chemical change that isn't from the enthalpy. The ability to spread the particles out farther, making it less likely for it to be able to be in one spot and be a solid, favor this chemical change occurring. This propensity to spread material out is called entropy. And it's just not material. Here was a particle view level of it, but energy especially. Entropy is a measure of the dispersal of a system. The real driving force behind whether a reaction is spontaneous or not doesn't just involve the enthalpy, it also involves the entropy. How distributed is the system after the reaction or the chemical change? There's a favorability to have things be more distributed, more spread out. And this affects whether a reaction will be spontaneous or not.